Let's get right into this session with a quick quiz. Looking at this chart in front of you, what is one aspect of prices other than direction and other than phase, i.e. other than trend or balance, can you notice about this chart? So we've been talking about direction, we've been talking about the phase of their state of the market, i.e. either it's trending or it's balancing. But there's something else, there's one other aspect to markets, market behavior and prices that we haven't touched upon yet. So looking at this chart, what other quality of price movement can you see? Well, this is something we've actually been touching upon indirectly time and time again, but we haven't actually took the time to identify it, label it and dissect it and go into it deeply. And this market aspect is volatility. Just by looking at this chart, you can see there were times when the market was extremely volatile, as in this part. The bars are huge, they're all over the place, up and down. And you can see there were times when the market was really quiet, as in this part. Yes, it was moving up in one direction, but look how small the bars are compared to these candles. They're tiny. All right. Now this is, in essence, irrespective of state. For instance, here there is directional movement, and yet very large volatility, right? Here there is sideways movement, and yet huge volatility, okay? Here there was sideways movement, and yet much smaller volatility than here. And so just by looking at this chart, the first thing we can conclude about volatility is the fact that it's cyclical in nature. It happens in cycles. You go through periods of market volatility, then you go through periods of low volatility. Now, it's not exact high, low, high, low. That would be way too easy, but it is cyclical. You go through periods of high volatility, followed by periods of lower volatility, and so on. Now, what causes volatility, and why is it important to understand it? Let's zero in on this chart a bit and discuss those things. Okay, I've moved in to this period where there was a lot of high volatility that we were looking at while well, zoomed out. And when you look at some of these market days, we're looking at the S&P 500 futures, by the way. But when you look at some of these days, right, you have some days, for instance, like here, even within this period of large volatility, you have some tiny days like here where the market moved maybe about 10 or 15 points in one day. And then you have some days like this and this and this, you know, where the market might have moved 30, 40 or 50 points in one day. So what causes the market to move so much in one day versus another day? And what are the mechanics that drive that movement? Well, this can be answered on a couple different levels. And the way to answer it is to think back about when we first started the training, this whole training. In the first session, we talked about the two main things that affect market behavior. And those were the underlying fundamental supply and demand equation. And two, the human psychology aspect that influences the supply and demand and ends up influencing prices themselves. And so when you look at volatility, there's really two aspects to it, right? The first aspect is that sometimes some underlying supply and demand fundamental changes enough and quickly enough to cause a major change in the perception of value in the market. And because the markets are relatively efficient, they move quickly to adjust prices to that changed value perception. So for instance, looking at this bar here, this large big green bar, all right, something happened in the underlying supply and demand fundamentals of the market to cause a change in the perception of value. And it was seen that value should be higher. So buyers took control and shot it way up. Now, why is this bar much bigger than a lot of these other bars? Well, because whatever happened on this day, whatever major event or economic news announcement or anything else 
it was big enough to cause a pretty substantial revaluation of value that caused the market to make a big move in one day. Now the other aspect of it is the human psychology. And quite often what happens is that as markets are moving and they start gaining directional conviction and momentum, this directional conviction and momentum itself influences the other market players like we talked about before. And it causes crowd psychology, crowd behavior, and a piling on effect where people are now entering just because prices are flying higher and their greed and their hope gets them to enter. And if we look at it from yet another slightly different perspective, we remember the law that previous market behavior affects current market behavior, right? And we know that these aren't just bars that we look at visually on a chart. They represent actual behavior. And if you look here that the market was dropping pretty rapidly, that means there must have been a lot of short sellers getting into the market at this point. And then it reversed so quickly in like a V shape and it was moving up. On this day when it started really taking off, the pain of the shorts intensified. They were losing more and more now on their short positions and they start having to cover, which accelerates an already fast movement once it gets going, which causes these larger volatile days. So they all play hand in hand and you can't really dissect and say it was this only this specific reason. But in general, what causes volatility is usually some major, let's say geopolitical event, some crisis, some surprise news, some natural disaster, let's say, economic news announcements that fall out of line. You know, if there is some economic news coming out and everyone is expecting a number and it comes out exactly as it was expected, maybe that won't affect the markets much. But if it comes out much better or much worse than expected, what happens? The perception of value will instantly change because people were expecting a certain level and it came out much higher or much lower. So prices have to correct very quickly and efficiently to that change perception. And so you get that volatile movement. But the other thing that ends up causing volatility is also uncertainty. Think about it. If the markets are uncertain about what true value is and there are enough important events in the world going on where the underlying value perception can change from moment to moment and yet there's no real conviction about what that is, you're going to get a time like this. Whereas on the biggest of time frames, this is just seen as a balance area, right? Or an equilibrium. But when you zoom into it, this is a period of uncertainty between buyers and sellers. And one day they're taking the price down huge and one day they're flying up really hard too. Because whatever is out there in the geopolitical landscape or the economic landscape is important enough to change the major value perception quickly. So it's up and down all over the place. So whenever you have huge levels of uncertainty in the market, you're going to get large volatility. Whenever you have major crowd behavior, you're going to get these market sentiment extremes and you're going to get volatility. You know, you're going to get major periods of hope or major periods of fear. And when times are slow, there's no major economic events. There's nothing to really change the perception of value. You're going to get these tiny days where it might be trending up slowly as the overall value perception is moving higher. But there's nothing significant happening from day to day to cause major movements. So it just goes up slowly on small range bound days as the value perception stays consistent, relatively speaking, from one day to another while having an upward slope. And the mechanics of volatility really come down to volume, trade volume. If you have very few orders coming into the market, you're not going to get much movement, right? But if you have massive volume of orders coming in from the institutions, which are really the ones that move the markets, this is where you're going to get this massive volatility. And when you get the major world events, when you get the major economic news announcements that are out of line or in line, those are the times that drive in the big players with the big volume and you see this large movement. Because those are the times 
when either they get into new positions because of the major change of perception or their old positions are suddenly underwater, they're losing money and they're forced to exit. And when millions of dollars are forced to exit the market, you're going to get some major movement one way or another. Which leads us to our second question, and that is why is this all important? Now, you know, a lot of this can be common sense. So yes, when you have major news and when you have a lot of geopolitical action happening, that the markets are going to move more. And when there's nothing, they're going to be slow, right? But why is it important to know this? And why is it important to decipher the volatility environment we're in, in general? Because you can always have one large day, for instance, like this, in the midst of slow movement. But what we're looking at is what is the general environment? For instance, this from here, from this initial drop all the way, all the way to here, this was a whole general high volatility environment. Yes, it had some smaller days, but on, on the whole, it was a much higher volatility environment, where this in general is a much lower volatility environment. So it's not about one or two days, it's what, what environment we're in. And why this matters is because it's when we get into strategy and tactics, it's greatly going to influence how you trade the market, where you place your stops, how far you place exits, what kind of risk management you take, what kind of position sizing, it affects everything. And so volatility ends up being a key thing in learning how to trade well. Most traders are sitting there looking at chart patterns, looking at setups out of context, forgetting about this key thing of volatility, this, this waxing and waning of volatility that influences all of those patterns while greatly changing the risk dynamics of the market either up or down. So it simply can't be ignored. And one final thing I'll say here before going on to uh, showing how we measure volatility more objectively is that uh, as you can tell usually except for a few couple days, down markets, markets that are falling, will generally show higher volatility than rising markets. All right. Now, yes, there are some large rising days, and that's fine. But in general, markets fall faster and harder than they rise. And this is something that should be known as common sense in pretty much everything in life. You know, it always takes much longer to build something than to destroy it. It takes two years to build a building and it takes 30 seconds to blow it up and destroy it. All right? Well, same thing here. Fear is stronger than greed. Think about your own life or even your own trading. Yes, you try to gravitate towards what you want or towards profits, but what you don't want or losses in the case of trading is always much scarier and motivates you to action more. And fear is what really can get contagious and just breed more and more fear. And that's when everyone piles into the selling and you get this massive, quick downside movement. Whereas price rises, on average, you'll get some of these big volatility bars, but then you'll get slower, kind of this upside drifting type of movement. On average, of course, there are scenarios where it's not like that. But as a whole, when you're seeing down markets, you're likely to see higher volatility. So that's just something to keep in mind. But now, how do we measure volatility? So let's zoom back out again. All right, here we are. And let's see how a couple different ways of measuring volatility. The first way is what's called the average true range. Now let's pull up this indicator right now. All right. So this on the bottom of your chart, you see is an indicator called the average true range. And all this indicator is measuring is what is the average range of one day? That's, that's all it's trying to do. And you can smooth it out over a certain period. So what I'm showing here is a 10 period average true range, which means that at any given point, like right now, it's showing it as 16, okay? This means that the last 10 days when you average them out, the average range of each day is 16 points, right? And when we're here, we see that it's around 60, all the way from 16. That means volatility here is about four times higher than it is here. 
and it's just the way of objectively seeing where volatility is at. Now you can look at it visually and it's pretty quick to, to notice, but sometimes you'll just get one big day and then a bunch of small days and the volatility environment hasn't really changed. And sometimes you'll see this line trending higher. You'll see that, yeah, the last few days have been quite volatile. So it could be telling you that, you know, we're in a pretty high volatility environment. Now, this is good for just seeing generally pretty quickly what the volatility environment is like. But it'll be also very useful when you're actually trading the market to know what the average range of the last 10 or whatever days. It could be a 10 look back period. It could be 20 days. It could be whatever you choose. I choose usually to look at a 10 or 20 days back. It's very helpful because, for instance, and we're not getting into tactics yet, but I'll just give you an example so you understand it. If you're looking at the average 10-day range and it's 16, right? And this day that you're currently in has already moved 15 points higher. Getting long and buying when we're already 15 points higher, where the average is 16, unless there's something really different about this day that's showing you that, you know, it's going to keep extending, that's probably not a good idea because you're reaching the upper limits of the current volatility environment, right? Whereas in this period, you know, if you got short in one of these days and it's dropped 10 points, well, maybe you shouldn't be so quick to take your profits because these days are showing an average of 50 or 60 points. That's one way to use volatility. Another way you'll notice to use it later, we'll discuss it, is in determining your stop levels. If volatility is really high, your stops better be wide or you're just going to get taken out based on market noise. Whereas here, in cases where volatility is low, you can tighten up your stops. That's also going to affect your position sizing. All things we'll get into, but... Just so you know, volatility is very important. So this is one way to gauge it. Well, what's another way? Let's check that out. All right, what you'll now see in the bottom pane is something that's called the VIX indicator. Now, the VIX is commonly referred to as the fear index or a fear gauge. And the VIX is implied volatility. Not actual historical volatility that the average true range was showing us, but implied volatility. Now, what does this mean? It'll be a little hard to explain its exact meaning because I would have to get into options and all the way they're built and how they're priced. But suffice it to say that based on how options work, their price is influenced by the perception of what volatility is going to be in the near future. And so if the market participants expect much higher volatility, the price of options is going to be higher. And if they expect low volatility, the price of options is going to be low. Now from their price, you can deduce what's called the implied volatility, which is what volatility do market participants perceive is going to take place over the next 30 day period. And the reason why it's called a fear index is because like we discussed before, most of the time, the real volatility is high on market drops, where there's major uncertainty and fear in the market. And that's usually when the price of option goes much higher and the implied volatility of the options is high. And so that's why this is called usually the fear index. Regardless of the how it's built or reasons why, what you need to know, if we don't get too deep into options, which we're not going to at this point, is that when the VIX is high relative to its previous readings, the volatility environment is usually pretty high. There's uncertainty. Most of the time, there was a pretty decent sized drop in the market and then some back and forth large volatility like here. And then once the market gets out of that and just starts... Um, it's more kind of drifting up phase. You see volatility go down, the VIX will go down, and that kind of ushers a different phase or cycle of the market when we have smaller ranges. Now, vol the VIX is very cyclical. If you look at a multi-year VIX chart, and actually let me pull up a chart of that and show you what it's like. Okay, here we are. This is the VIX volatility index all the way from 1985 to mid-2011. And as you'll see, it's quite cyclical. This massive 
VIX reading up to 150 was the 1987 crash. As you see at that point, I mean, the market crashed over 20% in one day at that point, and uh, fear was at all-time highs, uncertainty was at all-time highs, and we get a massive VIX reading. And the ranges of the day that day and the days following it were massive, and that's why you get this. There was huge volatility. But then naturally it'll drop. Elevated volatility never stays that high. There isn't always some crazy events happening. Usually things die down, and you get into a generally more normal level of volatility. But here's what you notice about this chart. You get periods, and each of these vertical lines is a, a year, but you get periods when you get huge volatility, and this was historic, you know, but and then you go down, right? And then you get spikes in volatility, and then you go down again, and then so on. You get spikes of volatility, multiple years of high volatility go down again, and so on. Now, if you look at it, what were these periods? Well, when you get such massive spikes in volatility, usually the, and it'll die down, but usually the two or three or four years after that will be pretty volatile themselves in relative terms to what came before. Then you'll usually get, you know, a slow period. Here the VIX is, you know, gets to around 10, which is a very low historical level. 10, 15, something like that. And it stayed there for one, two, three, four, five years. So this was about five years of pretty slow trading. Markets were not moving that much. Of course, you'll have spikes within it, like here and here. But in general, it was relatively low. And then you'll get periods. Here it was the dot-com bubble, you know, 98, 99, 2000, when things were flying like crazy. And this period happened to be a little different because this was high volatility on average to the upside. And that was because of this bubble where everything was euphoric, all these dot-coms were coming out overnight and people were expecting their prices to go to the moon. Everyone is buying just on pure greed and hope and multi-billion dollar companies would be born almost overnight even though they had no, no real value. And that just shows the human psychology aspect where the underlying fundamentals did not support their prices but people were buying. It was crowd behavior, crowd psychology, and they were buying, and they were buying them up so fast that you had these huge upside ranges. And for a period of, you know, a good four or five years, you had good volatility. And there was some crises in the middle of this. This was late 97. This was what's called the long-term capital management crisis. It was a multi-billion dollar hedge fund that went bust and almost took down the entire economic system. So you'll have those things also causing volatility. And then when we came out of the big drop of 2000, 2001, 2002, which was the fear-based volatility era after this big bubble, all right, we started drifting upwards. Market went slow for about a good three or four years here. And we went back again to this 10, 15 level of volatility. And then came the housing bubble credit crisis of 2008. And this thing shot up to near historical highs again. This time it wasn't a one, two day type thing and like in 1987, it was more sustained at this higher level. And then it dropped with momentary big spikes. And on this time, just like here, right? It held, it never reached those back to down to those 10 levels. It was generally more elevated volatility environment for several years. And this is what happens. This is the big picture view of market volatility, how we move in cycles. This is the biggest picture view. And what I was showing you on the chart before, let's go back to it now. Okay, here, right? This was just a daily view. This is a much, much shorter term picture. And when I zoomed into here, this that was even a shorter term picture of volatility. But now you see how it works. But the way to measure it, other than visually looking at a chart and just kind of feeling what kind of environment you're in, you got the VIX, which gives you an objective number of volatility now and how it compares to the past. And you have the average true range, which shows you what the actual daily range for each day is on an average basis. But, and now I've changed the bottom panel again, there's one other way to gauge volatility that most people don't know how to use it in this instance, which is volume. Like we said, right, regardless of the under reasons of why there's volatility, of there's you know uncertainty and, and, and economic news or major events or whatever it is, the way you get large volatility is through 
the institutions and the big volume coming into the markets and making the market move. And here, when this big drop was coming, look at the elevated volume levels in the market. And that generally stayed elevated this whole period, right, compared to this period, for instance, of low volume. So volume ends up being another objective gauge into the kind of environment we're in. If we're getting high volume days one day after the other, we're going to get large ranges of those days. And on days where we have low volume, usually the range is going to be small. So that's our general discussion of volatility. We've packed it all into one session, just kind of give you the meat of it all. We're going to be coming back to various things about volatility, how it affects your trading, how it affects market days throughout the training. But I just want to give you this basic overview now so when we touch on it later, you'll understand where it's all coming from. You'll understand what it's all based on. And it'll even influence the times of the day you trade and, and if you trade or not. All these things volatility will influence. So we'll keep touching back on it throughout the training. But this is just a good overview of what causes volatility, why it happens, and various ways to measure it as a whole and within the day kind of early on. So absorb this material. It'll serve you going forward.